In this video, we're going to put our understanding of regiochemistry and stereochemistry in the E2 reaction to the test by predicting products and looking at some interesting outcomes of E2 and attempted E2 reactions. And the first context we're going to look at here is substituted cyclohexanes. Cyclohexyl halides containing a good leaving group linked to a cyclohexane ring. Here we want to think carefully about the chair conformation of cyclohexane, since this affects what can be anti to the carbon leaving group bond. Take, for example, cyclohexyl chloride. This is a compound with two chair forms. And what we observe with cyclohexyl chloride is that the equatorial conformation, which is the major conformation of this compound, right? This is more stable because the chlorine's in an equatorial position, reacts at a negligibly slow rate in E2 eliminations. On the other hand, the axial conformer with the Cl in an axial position reacts rapidly in E2 eliminations. What in the world is going on here? The only difference between these two molecules is conformational, right? And so this has something to do with the alignment of the carbon-chlorine bond, particularly with respect to a beta-CH bond that would need to be eliminated and positioned anti to the carbon-chlorine bond in order for E2 to take place at an appreciable rate. If we look at the equatorial conformer from a Newman projection view, we'll notice something interesting about the carbon-chlorine bond. There is no anti-CH to that equatorial carbon-chlorine bond. The carbon-chlorine bond is anti to a carbon-carbon bond in the ring. So there, there are only gauche hydrogens to the chlorine, if you like. And with no anti-CH, there's no E2 elimination of that chloride occurring. This is why the equatorial conformer reacts in a negligibly slow way, uh, uh, slow rate rather, in E2 eliminations. After a chair flip, however, notice that the chlorine has been flipped. This carbon chlorine bond has been flipped up into an axial position where it is now anti to a CH bond. And so now in this conformation, now that the carbon chlorine bond is anti, to the axial hydrogen on the carbon next door, E2 elimination occurs rapidly. It must also be the case in cyclohexyl halides that the eliminated hydrogen and leaving group are on opposite sides of the ring. If they're not on opposite sides of the ring, it's impossible to get them in an anti-relationship in either chair conformer. This leads to some interesting outcomes. For instance, consider this substrate. Zaitsev type elimination of this substrate would suggest removing this hydrogen to produce a relatively stable tri-substituted double bond. That would lead to the product shown at the bottom of the slide. This product is not observed. Instead, we observe only the Hoffman product, and this happens regardless of the steric bulk of the base. Only the di-substituted alkene is observed. And we can understand this if we draw out a chair conformation for this compound and think about what's going on. Here's the chlorine in its axial orientation as required, we looked at that in this example above, for E2 elimination. Now consider what's anti to that chlorine at the carbons next door, there and there. At this carbon in the front, we've got a methyl group that is anti to the chlorine. So we actually can't eliminate there. This hydrogen that would have to be eliminated is gauche to the carbon-chlorine bond, and that gauche relationship is not good for E2 elimination. On the other hand, at the less substituted carbon back here, we do have a CH bond that is anti to the carbon-chlorine bond, and so elimination is going to occur there selectively, since that's the anti-orientation we need for E2 elimination, and this leads to the di-substituted double bond. A case of kinetics overwhelming thermodynamics on some level, the only kinetically accessible pathway for elimination with the CH and CCL bonds anti leads to the less substituted alkene. The case on the right is really interesting in that we have a relatively sterically crowded secondary alkyl halide in the presence of a strong base, methoxide, unhindered base. And despite all this, we actually do not observe E2 elimination but SN2 substitution instead with rever inversion of configuration. What the heck is going on here? Well, again, the chair conformation is going to shed some light. If we draw the chair conformer with the carbon-chlorine bond axial, because this is the one, again, in which E2 elimination occurs, anti to that carbon-chlorine bond, there are two methyl groups. And so there are no anti-CH bonds to that carbon-chlorine bond, 
both of the CH bonds that those carbons are gauche to the carbon chlorine bond. And so E2 elimination cannot take place because there is no anti-CH bond to the carbon chlorine bond in this substrate. In this practice problem, we're asked to predict which of these cyclohexanes will undergo E2 elimination more rapidly. We really want to think about chair forms, particularly with that turf butyl group being in there, there's going to be a huge bias for one chair form versus the other. And we're looking for which of the two favored chair forms would be expected to undergo more rapid E2 elimination. We know from the previous slide that elimination will only occur when the carbon chlorine bond is axial chlorine is in an axial position. So let's start with the chair forms that have that carbon chlorine bond in an axial position like so. And I've added in a couple of the beta hydrogens that are going to be important for us to consider. If we look at this top case first, we'll see that there are some CH bonds that are anti to the carbon chlorine bond. So E2 elimination can occur in this conformation. But there's an issue with this conformation. Pause the video and see if you can figure it out. What's the problem with this conformation? It's got an axial terbutyl group. That's going to make it heavily disfavored relative to the flipped form, which puts the terbutyl group equatorial and the carbon chlorine bond equatorial. But we've previously seen that the problem with this with respect to E2 is that now we've got two carbon carbon bonds anti to the carbon chlorine bond now that that bond is equatorial. And so although this is the favored conformer by a, by a mile and, and then some, right, because of the massive terbutyl group here, no E2 will occur in this dominant conformation of this compound. In the second case, we have, again, two CH bonds that are anti to the carbon chlorine bond in this conformation with the chlorine axial. And the terbutyl group here now is in an equatorial position since this is a diastereomer of the molecule above, right? Notice that this chlorine is pointed down and the terbutyl group pointed up in this structure. So that's now the favored conformation. The flipped chair conformer has the terbutyl group in an axial position and the carbon chlorine bond in an equatorial position. So just as in the case above, we have no E2 in this conformer with the carbon-chlorine bond equatorial. We're anti to two carbon-carbon bonds. No anti-CH bonds in that conformation. On the other hand, E2 occurs rapidly where we have this anti-relationship between the CH bonds and the carbon-chlorine bond, and this is the favored conformer. And so because it's favored, it's the dominant conformer in solution for this compound, and it engages in rapid E2, this compound is going to engage in faster E2 reaction overall. So it all came down to considering both did I have any anti-CH bonds to the carbon chlorine bond and which of the two chair conformations is favored. Because of course, we can always put the chlorine axial, right, just by flipping the chair. The question is, is that a favored conformation or not? If not, that flip is going to be disfavored such that it won't really accelerate E2, even though we can put the C-Cl bond in an axial position. Here we're going to look at three examples of E2 reactions and predict their products considering regiochemistry and stereochemistry. All right. In the first case, we've got this relatively complicated secondary alkyl halide reacting with sodium ethoxide and ethanol. And really the first thing we should do in these reactions is kind of take it back to basics with alkyl halides and look for the halide, right? Recognize where the leaving group is located. This is going to point us also to the beta carbons where we can eliminate a hydrogen to get the E2 elimination reaction going. So here, for example, we've got two distinct beta carbons here and here, but we're using an unhindered base, ethoxide, right? So elimination is going to occur selectively at the more substituted position with this unhindered base to give the uh, more substituted alkene. Yes, but there's more to the story here. There's a stereochemical issue, right? Because this methyl group could end up, for instance, cis to the phenyl ring or trans to the phenyl ring. And because we're dealing with E2 and the stereospecificity requirement, only one of those two alkenes is going to be observed. To determine the favored alkene, let's draw a Newman projection with the CH and CCL bonds anti to each other to start. And then we're going to lay down the rest of the substituents based on the configurations implied by this drawing, essentially converting this into this Newman projection by looking down the bond this way, looking down the, the uh, alpha-beta bond 
this way. Okay, so we've got this carbon in the front. And if we imagine this H being at the top of our field of vision, the fennel ring is going to be down and to the right. At the back carbon, the H will be up and to the left and the methyl up and to the right. And so we have an implied hydrogen that's going to be up and to the left and a methyl up and to the right. It's worth pausing the video to verify that. At the front carbon, as I just mentioned, we're going to have that phenyl ring down and to the right and the isopropyl down and to the left with this H oriented kind of up as it is. So this is the transition state leading to the product. And, it, and in the final product, we're going to have the phenyl ring cis to the methyl group. So the final product is going to look something like this. The methyl group is indeed cis to the phenyl ring and is trans to the isopropyl group. And this again comes from the anti-periplanar requirement for E2 elimination and the configurations built into the alkyl halide substrate, which we must respect in this transition state, right? In this Newman projection, we have to have those same configurations. Otherwise, we're thinking about a different compound than the one given. In the second case here, we have again ethoxide as the base, and so we would expect a Zaitsev product in this case. And now we do have two distinct types of, of beta carbons, but we're going to eliminate at the more substituted carbon to produce the more substituted alkene, the tri-substituted alkene in this case. No methylene cyclohexane would be observed, no double bond right there. And there's actually no stereochemical issue in this reaction. Since we're in a six-membered ring, we're necessarily going to get a cis double bond here, right? Uh, at least if we, if we pay attention to the ring carbons, the ring carbons must be cis when we're talking about cyclohexenes. In the third case, we've got now tert-butoxide as the base. That's bulky. And so we'll get the Hoffman elimination products. Notice we have a CH here at a relatively substituted position and a CH2 group here, relatively unsubstituted. Elimination is going to occur at the less substituted position selectively right there leading to this alkene. And again, because we're in a six-membered ring, it's a cyclohexene, and the two carbons here must be cis to each other as a result, there's no, no stereochemical issue here, which is quite nice. 